let's talk about the history of Basel regulation. This type of microprudential regulation is a set of accords between many European countries, but it has evolved over time to tune how certain risks are calculated and add additional risks. Let's take a look at how it's evolved. The Basel Accords have gone through multiple iterations and they make several demands of banks in terms of compliance. Specifically, we mean microprudential compliance. So, although they include multiple microprudential measures, including possibly leverage ratios, liquidity ratios, and so on, we are going to focus in specific on regulatory capital for specific and identified risk areas. That is, capital set aside as a cushion to protect against loss events from those risks. Specifically, we'll cover credit risk, market risk, and operational risk, which are the three key areas in the present as of December 2021 under Basel 3, although these may change for Basel 4. These areas have evolved in the following manner. Just a very short history lesson. The first version of Basel, at the time known as the Basel Accord and retroactively known as Basel 1, focused simply on credit risk. The goal was to protect the typical business of banks, if you will. It was simplistic in terms of weights, and it had limited risk sensitivity. Then, in 1996, an amendment included market risk, as well as introducing the multiple approaches, including, for market risk, the internal models approach using value at risk. Basel II expanded on Basel I, including methodologies to measure these two risks and inserting operational risk. It also brought a three-pillar framework, which included two other pillars besides regulatory capital, which were about bank supervision and disclosure to investors. Basel 2.5 was released right after the Great Financial Crisis, and it brought immediate measures to mitigate its causes, such as additional capital charges for credit products and structured finance products. Then, Basel III was a major revamp. It was also in response to the great financial crisis, but in longer term. It fine-tuned Basel 2.5 with a focus on new aspects, including liquidity and leverage, besides changing the capital tiers. As of December 2021, the only update after Basel III has been the FRTB or Fundamental Review of the Trading Book in 2019. Although Basel IV hasn't come out yet, it's informally known as the beginning of Basel IV. And this update in specific addresses how market risk is calculated, both in terms of the standardized approach and its weights, and also the methodology for the internal models approach. Although the three risk categories, credit risk, market risk, and operational risk, are distinct, the Basel Accords usually provide two to three layers of approaches to regulatory capital calculation. Each bank can select one of the three. The more sophisticated it is, usually the more demands the bank has. The first approach is usually a basic indicator approach, where one single measure is used. For example, for operational risk, the basic indicator approach says that 15% of all gross revenue is set aside. If you have 10 billion in gross revenue, you have 1.5 billion set aside just for operational risk. Very simple, but very conservative. The second layer is some sort of standardized approach. This is where a risk weight is given to an asset class or a department or a category, and we simply multiply the weights by the quantities. For example, for operational risk, you have a percentage by department. Asset management is 12%, so it's 12% of their revenue. The payments department has a weight of 18%, so that's multiplied by the revenue. And then you sum everything up. It's still not very deep, but it's much better than the basic indicator. And finally, we always have some kind of internal model approach. That is, where the bank develops an internal model 
or internal data to estimate their regulatory capital. So an internal model to calculate credit ratings, to calculate operational risk losses, to calculate value at risk for trading positions, and so on. It's important to note that, in general, these three layers grow in level of sophistication and costs to estimate, and they decrease in terms of capital calculated. For example, the basic indicator approach where it exists always takes less effort than the standardized one, which always takes less effort than an internal approach. But the basic approach is very conservative, the standardized approach is a little bit less conservative, and the internal model approach is more efficient. And remember, the more efficient the estimation is, the less capital that is set aside that you can't invest. It's also important to note that since Basel III, there will be a move towards the standardized approach as a floor for regulatory capital. This is because the internal models approaches historically have not worked that well, are always underestimating risk, no matter how sophisticated the model. So in the future, you will see that besides the internal approach, they will also have to calculate the standardized approach and use a percentage of it as a floor to the calculation. Let's start with credit risk. Credit risk, regulatory capital, can be measured with two approaches, one of them subdividing into two. So technically, it's three approaches, I guess. First, there's no basic indicator approach for credit risk. So the first one that we have is the standardized one. And what we do is, we take the capital for each type of asset based on its risk rating, which is usually from an external agency. And naturally, different asset types have different ratings. Then we multiply it by the weight. There is a full table on the Basel reference guide. But for example, if we have 100 million of sovereign debt that is AAA, that has a 0% weight. So it's 0 times 100 million. Then we may have another 100 million of sovereign debt, which is AA minus, which may have a 5% weight. So for that one, it's 5 million. And then we sum all capital quantities by their risk weights. The next type of approach is the internal ratings based or IRB approaches. As we'll see, in this type of approach, the bank does not use external data. They develop a model to calculate the ratings internally and estimate the capital required based on that. In internal models, there are always three key metrics in credit portfolios. The PD, or probability of default, the LGD, or loss given default, and the EAD, or exposure at default. And the difference between these two is how many of these three the bank calculates. So in the foundation, internal ratings-based approach, or foundation, IRB, the bank only calculates the PV or probability of the fault for each loan. And the bank supervisor is the one that calculates the LGD and EAD. In the advanced IRB approach, the bank simply calculates all three. Naturally, this requires more data and a very solid model. Market risk can be estimated by two approaches. There's no basic indicator approach for market risk either. Then we have the standardized approach. It's very similar to the standardized approach for credit risk. We have different asset types with different weights, and then we multiply each asset capital by the risk weight, and we add everything up. That's it. And there's a table for these asset types as well. Maybe you have 100 million in a specific portfolio with a 5% risk weight, so that's 5 million. Maybe you have another 100 million in a riskier portfolio with a 30% weight, and that's 30 million, and so on. And you add everything up. It's important to note that banks that have already implemented the fundamental review of the trading book post Basel III have to use a more complicated system. It is still a sum of different weights for different asset types, but now there are different weights and more complex ones. In this case, there is a sum of three different risk charges for each asset type. There is a base risk charge, which includes delta risk, vega risk, and curvature risk, then a default risk charge, 
for credit sensitivity and then a residual risk add-on. Then we have the internal models approach. In this approach, we don't use weights on a table. We actually develop an internal model to calculate, usually, value at risk. But different versions of Basel use different methods. What I mean is, if the bank has not implemented Basel 3, they must use a 99% confidence level value at risk over 10 days. That's it. If they are after Basel 3, but before the fundamental review of the trading book, then they use a stress VAR measure, which has been introduced. In this case, they calculate the usual value at risk, but also another version in parallel that instead of using their historical data, uses one year of very stressed market data, and we calculate that stressed VAR. It's kind of a worst case VAR, and regulators will want to see both. If the bank has implemented the fundamental review of the trading book, it becomes a little bit more complex. They fully replace the 99% VAR with a 97.5 expected shortfall, also known as conditional value at risk, which is exactly the same as the 99% VAR within the confidence interval, but it also calculates extreme loss events outside that interval. But also, the bank has to calculate it for five liquidity intervals, that is, five different timeframes, and also both for the total portfolio, but also for each individual trading desk. Operational risk regulatory capital can be estimated using one of three methods. The first is the basic indicator approach. In this case, it's simply a percentage of the bank's total gross income. 15% is of Basel III, but it may change. So if the bank has earned 100 billion in gross income, the regulatory capital for this risk is 15 billion. Simple, but very high. Then we have a standardized approach, analogous to the two previous categories. We have specific weights, but in this case, instead of for specific assets, we have them for specific departments. For example, Asset management is 12%. So if you have 100 billion of revenue for that department, it's 12 billion for that department. Payments is 18%. So if you have another 100 billion of revenue in that department, it's 18 billion for that department. And just like with the other standardized approaches, the total, it's the sum of the capital numbers multiplied by the risk weights. Out of curiosity, for these two, the gross revenue is not the current one, but the average of the gross revenue for the last three years. And then we have the advanced measurement approach. In this case, the bank draws from its own operational risk loss events, and it uses internally generated models to calculate their operational risk capital requirements. They predict using historical data, which will be the operational losses. Out of curiosity, the internal models approaches for the three risk categories have had inconsistent results on a bank-by-bank -bank basis, but the advanced measurement approach for operational risk is the worst of all of them. Bank supervisors over time have not been able to find banks that reach similar capital levels for similar departments in business lines at all anywhere in the world. So this is the worst offender in terms of models. As mentioned, for all of these risk areas, the more sophisticated the methodology is to estimate risk, the higher the requirements are for the bank. So if you want to use the basic indicator approach, there are no requirements. If you want to use the standardized one, you need basic systems in place, you need a risk management function, and so on. And if you want to use internal models approaches, you need a very high level of sophistication in model design, risk management controls, and so on. And additionally, the higher the level of supervisory scrutiny placed upon the bank. So I'm not just saying that you need a risk management function or model validation. I'm saying that supervisors are going to actively come and gauge these. And if they're not satisfied, you're not authorized to use that approach. And additionally, any bank that uses an internal model approach, so the third of the three, 
for any category and that underestimates real risk losses. In other words, the model doesn't work either because it's bad or because the bank is cutting corners on purpose, may be sanctioned, including being forced to adopt a simpler approach. So the supervisor may force the bank to stop using an internal model and go back to a standardized one. It's also interesting here to note that supervisors allow banks to use a mixture of standardized and internal if the models are only good for specific things. For example, let's say that a bank, in terms of operational risk, has a model that's very good at predicting risk, but only for asset management. The regulators usually allow the bank to use the internal models approach or advanced measurement approach, using the correct name, just for the asset management department and to use the standardized approach for everything else. Supervisors allow this and even promote it if the bank's internal models only work for certain departments or asset categories. And additionally, the move since Basel III and projected towards Basel IV is towards discouraging internal models approaches. This is because the Basel Committee has come to the sad conclusion that internal models are usually not working. They're very inconsistent across banks, and especially for operational risk, they consistently fail. So it's predicted that the standardized approach will be also calculated and be used as floors, not the full value, but a percentage. For example, let's say you calculate the standardized approach and it yields 100 billion and the floor is 50%. So the minimum capital is 50 billion. Even if your internal models approach dictates 40 billion for that risk category, whichever one it may be, the floor is 50 billion. So it's going to be used in a way to control the internal models and to prevent them from not working, if you will. What are some examples? The first is regulatory arbitrage. Banks that have not yet implemented the fundamental review of the trading book perform what's called regulatory arbitrage by moving assets between the trading book and the banking book. They choose the one of the two that requires the least capital for an asset. For example, a credit asset can go in the banking book subject to credit risk capital or the trading book subject to market risk capital. So let's say that a bank is using the standardized approach. They simply check the table for the credit risk capital and they check the table for the market risk capital for the standardized approaches and they gauge which one of the two yields the least regulatory capital and they place the asset in that book. But the fundamental review of the trading book changes this. It has very clear guidelines on which specific assets go into each book with zero flexibility. And unsurprisingly, banks are resisting implementing it. Then, a lot of Basel regulation and a lot of bank regulation in general has been in response to problems and crises to prevent them from repeating. The market amendment to Basel I was due to the uncontrolled growth of instruments like derivatives, which had already occurred. Basel 2.5 and Basel 3 were in response to the great financial crisis, which had already occurred. And the fundamental review of the trading book is in response to regulatory arbitrage and the inadequacy of the market risk models, which had already occurred. So a lot of bank regulation occurs because some kind of problem has already happened and regulators don't want it to happen again. And finally, additional risks and risk capital may be included. Just to clarify, under Basel, we have three pillars. This methodology started with Basel II, but it has been maintained so far. So pillar one is about regulatory capital for these three risks, credit, market, operational. It's what we've been talking about. But pillar two is about bank supervision, and it allows supervisors to examine other risks not talked about here, such as concentration risk, liquidity risk, and so on. And it also allows bank supervisors to make additional capital demands. So for example, a bank may have 12 billion of credit risk regulatory capital and the supervisor may say, well, due to your client concentration, I'm going to require that you keep another 3 billion 
of regulatory capital, and that's it, period. So they can increase these amounts. What are our key takeaways here? The first is that there are three main risk areas where regulatory capital is required to be calculated and allocated within the Pillar 1 of the Basel Accords. And these are credit risk, market risk, and operational risk. Then, there are usually three major approaches, regardless of the type of risk. Not all of them exist for all categories. For example, the basic indicator approach currently only exists for operational risk, while the other two currently exist for all categories. But in general, they are the basic indicator approach, which is some sort of fixed weight that's universal, then a standardized approach, which is some sort of multiplication of different weights for different classes of assets or departments or whatever it is, and finally, some sort of internal approach, which uses custom internal models. Then, the higher you climb, the steeper the fall. The more sophisticated the approach is that a bank uses, the lower the capital required, because it's more accurate, at least in theory, but also the higher the requirements and the scrutiny from bank supervisors. And remember, if an internal model is not accurate, the bank can be forced to be downgraded to a standardized approach on any or all of these three categories. And finally, while all three areas allow for internal approaches, this has failed in general, and the results are very inconsistent. So the Basel Committee will be promoting a move towards the standardized approach as a floor for future internal model calculations. Not 100% of it, but at least a percentage of it, so that it controls the results from internal models approaches. So as we see, the Basel Accords have evolved over time. And currently, in 2021, before Basel IV, the three main categories requiring risk capital are credit risk, market risk, and operational risk. And banks can usually select from one of three approaches to calculate each of these risk capitals. It's important to note that the advanced approach or internal models approach does not work, unfortunately, for a lot of cases. So there is going to be a move towards the standardized approach being a floor for calculations.